Then I met this girl from Chicago for about 10 seconds, Rose Lomack. She felt like someone stupid I grew up with. I liked her. Then she goes back to Chicago. She's moving here. Before she goes, she tells me she's doing a women's yeah. issue of her magazine. Send me something, okay? She says, yes, absolutely. Thank fucking God, hooray, finally a women's magazine in my world. She gives me a glazed look with both of her eyes. Who is this, another Mooney? We're standing in front of a dark red stone wall, and it's night. It's right around Mott Street, some old church. And to be safe, the wall has a lamp hanging down from its top, so you can see whoever's standing under it like an actor. And we are actors, me and Rose, in some kind of mean Italian streets night. The wall was a dark, fudgy red. We were out to get some beer, the two of us, left everyone else back in the loft. I want to go to bed with you, I said. Rose just looked stricken. I mean, I can hardly tell you how this course of events came about. I went from thinking she was kind of dumb, but in a good way, like my family, to thinking she was the hinge in my life. That's pretty hard. I once saw a play called The Emperor and the Architect, and the architect just dropped down from the sky, and so did this girl. I didn't know she was gay. I didn't know that at all. Oh, yeah, said Ted. I had to tell her to cut that out in class, he explained. Rose is holding hand with her girlfriend in class. Sorry, Rose. Rose has the best story about coming out. She was in her bedroom with her girlfriend and they were having sex. She was about to come and her mother burst into the room with a crossword puzzle in hand. How do you spell rec ecstasy, Rosemary? I couldn't believe a lesbian dropped right into my world. She's from Chicago. Is she beautiful? Well, she's kind of awkward. She does look like she's from another world half the time, but she's doing business on this side. Supposedly her family is mob. She comes to New York in a car, a dark orange Mustang. Imagine driving that around town. She sold it. I think they all drove out, her and Barbara and Chastler. Her and Barbara were Ted's poetry students and Chastler's philosophy students. Chastler left his wife and kids, or they came too, but they weren't together. They live uptown. Chastler's a situationist and he smokes pot. They all smoke pot, but they all work all the time and they have this amazing loft on Lafayette and Soho. They have this amazing world light pouring in on this extreme pot smoker day. Tons of space. Rose was on crutches when I first met her, so she looked a little puggy or something. And she had a bad haircut, so I think she had knee surgery from falling off her skateboard. Now she's slight, but strong, Polish, and as Barbara and Chastler sit at their long, family-sized desk, a white, big white hunk of wood that maybe takes a corner, and they're all in there working with hundreds of papers and selectrics, talking across the way to each other, where they're tapping on the keys and extending a joint back and forth. And this is probably the honeymoon of their newly designed life. And Rose, with all the day pouring into their god, like 3,000 square foot fucking loft, beautiful floors. Rose is on her skateboard gliding around. What am I doing here? Well. Just knowing Rose was gay made my walk across 2nd Ave, then Houston Street, up past Bellatos, and turning at the Puck Building when it was old and it was September, I think the most empty, triumphal September. I didn't even know this girl, but none of them working, me neither, so in order to stop my day, I had to go somewhere, so I took to walking to their place in the afternoon. Want some tea, I? she said. I always smoke pot because I'd just be outside sitting there if I didn't, but the people who smoked pot all day long became more themselves, and I, in contrast, would just get fixed, horribly installed, feeling my body get slow, and watching Rose whirl around the loft or picking up the phone and scheming. I didn't want to so much drink in front of her. That's what I wanted, a beer. She was planning her life, as if that was a thing you could do. She alluded to her modeling possibility. She had done that in Chicago. Or teaching. Why not some teaching? She was 22. She didn't have to work just to make money. I was collecting unemployment myself, a nice life, waking up for morning coffee and a poem and looking out the window. A squirrel would land on my fire escape, a bird or two. I moved to this apartment in May, and now it was fall and the trees were almost empty. I was preparing for my new life, La Vida Nuova, La Vida Nuova, I reported cryptically to my friends at Grassroots. I knew the ball had fallen, so I went to Oscar Wilde and bought some books. I was reading about Rene Vivienne, who had died for love. She sort of looked like Rose. And she wrote about someone that I think she was jealous of, maybe Natalie Barney, that she was nothing but a cunt with a pen. This was quoted as an example of Rene Vivienne's deterioration, her slow sink into mental illness. 
But I didn't see what was wrong with this at all. Is it so bad to talk about a woman and her writing in the same sentence, especially to insult her? Are we supposed to be fake? One morning, all the leaves were gone, and this thing had just gradually happened. My daily walk, as planned, it simply turned me into a dyke. I just needed some place to go, and this morning, out the window was Mary, you know, the mother of Christ. I had a cemetery out my window, and there was nothing but trees, but suddenly it's October, and I'm falling for Rose. I'm in love with a woman, I explained, looking into the eyes of a statue of the Creator's mother, or the Creator herself. It was all so stark, and I was losing weight like crazy. I felt like I was dying, but I began talking to Mary, and I was telling her about my love. October takes everything as usual, and I was pulling on my clothes. It seemed like the clouds were laughing at me in their majestic, gleaming beauty. I had always felt kind of tough, but now I was just a faggot. That was it. I felt like a gay man. I didn't feel any stronger being a lesbian. I felt weak. Look at me, God, I cried out. It seemed like being gay changed the thing of you. I started reading Sappho, and I saw what everyone was talking about when they told you to take words out of your poem. James Sherry lived in the Bowery between me and Rose, and his magazine was called Roof. It's just incredible that all of us were home in the day, in these big spaces, just fooling around. James lived with Lee, and they just had this pajama feel, like they'd been in there for days doing real cool drugs, opium or absinthe. Lee was his secret. I met James a while ago, and I knew he was secretly married, and now here she was, his cat of a wife. She just laughed and laughed. She did these beautiful bumpy paintings like whisperings of sea, sea. The paintings were a million horizons. Of course I liked to look at them, how persistent she was. You still do that? Yes, she smiled in her cute glasses, and then she laughed. I always thought about sleeping with these couples. That's what they wanted you to think about, I thought. They'd offer me a drink during the day, and then since James had a magazine, we had to get real serious and sit down to prove that we were working. Did you ever think about cutting words out? Do you mind, he asked, aiming at my poem? No, go ahead. This is like when it took a hundred years to type a poem, but so what? In the 70s, we had time. I mean, what was I going to do in the morning but retype this poem? Maybe listen to a record. James just skipped around, taking a few words out of each line. I think he was using whiteout. But you know, I thought he was being pretty orderly. Take that one out too, I said, egging him on. Really? Now I wouldn't do that, he said. Go ahead. Then in a second, I've got to go. I had to get to Rose's. What did I care if my poem had a lot of words in it or not? It was cold. Somewhere, a little goat boy was throwing stones into a hole that fell into a cave. Every third rock or so would go, cloink. What's that? He crawled up and inside struck a match and saw all this broken pots and saw stuff, very dry, like paper or leaves. He carried a load of it home, and they kept throwing it in the fireplace. It was winter in Greece. He kept bringing back more. Then he heard that there was this British guy on the other side of the island buying stuff. There was writing on the old parchment they were burning. This is the story of Sappho. Each piece we've got, and most of it was destroyed, is full of holes. Sappho didn't write tiny poems with giant leaps. They were torn. Everybody, mostly men, Swinburne, for example, has been filling her holes in ever since. She said, well, actually, you can say Sappho said anything. She said about two words, and then everyone, the world, jumps in. The walk to Rose with, Roses was a flood of details. Cars coming towards me as I crossed Houston. Put a cigarette to my lips. My lungs, this very good burn going down. I rub it, flooding my chest like a flower. Go into the bodega and pick up a couple of beers. The possibility that I should keep living in this particular time in which I had been born, not bleeding into all the other times. Hear this, this footstep, not that. Feel that possibility and let it leak. Bump into a friend. Even if he was talking and talking, I can jump in and stop him. People were hearing me now, a little bit. I liked standing up in a room full of people, giving the torrent of words I chose. But each poem was a tiny torrent, a hole. Each person was a monad, a jot. In Alice's class, she'd read out loud, I remember from Keats in some South Pole expedition, Cherry Garage. The idea was for us to hear the tumult and grab words, phrases. The fragment was key. It reminded me of my favorite contest ever in Boston, in which the kid who won got five minutes in the toy department to fill a cart with whatever they wanted. You could go and case the place, but clearly you might be feeling something different the day you won. I thought of when my whole family went to BC to hear my brother give a speech and he blacked out. That was my family, gone. Yet we were together. I would choose the goneness now, like bowing my head to love. 
I looked at the poem I held in my hand, a tiny bone. It looked a little thin. The thing is, you couldn't have all the fragments be the same size, right? Why would you do that? That's just pathetic, obtuse. It wouldn't be like chopping. I needed to win in some reverse way. I liked sentences, words, like this walk. I don't see everything, certainly not for the same length of time. What do I see? If I'm going to be a lesbian, it will be everywhere in my work, embedded, and I laughed. I imagine this thing called Sappho's boat, just like a swirl being a record of all my thoughts, and I could just pick one thing, not so importantly, but as you made a turn, the rhythm, the stray junk of your existence would be like momentarily displayed, like a map of your road. Throw it in the cart. Clunk. I got it. Finally, I got that. Eileen, everybody in New York wants to sleep with me. That's what she said. I imagine people in all the apartments and lofts, thousands of them, millions of people, all wanting Rose. Well, she was pretty cute. Rose, I want to sleep with you. She looked terrified, then her face kind of cracked, bursting forward, a brave little smile, but her eyes were insane. She looked like Kim Novak in Of Human Bondage, or Rosie Driffield, as I imagined her in Cakes and Ale. She was the willing tart, the voluptuous, depraved woman who would take me across the river of sex into the world of female desire. She was a kid, 22, I was 27. Still, was I afraid of sex? No, I was afraid of pregnancy. I didn't want to make the wrong thing. But when I liked sex, it was generally a mistake, doing the wrong thing with the wrong person in the wrong place. That's what worked. Rose had little blonde bangs. Come on, I, she said, grabbing me by the arm. We were lugging two six-packs, heading home. I'm thinking too much. <laughs>